Hi, um, if you've seen any of my videos, then you know that I have a quite a collection of haplopelma uh, tarantulas. Uh, this video is going to be a care sheet video of how I take care of them, and hopefully they'll answer any questions you have about how to take care of one. Um, if I don't if I don't answer your questions, then feel free to uh, ask them on the comment section, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Uh, before I begin, I should start out by saying um, this is not a display species spiders. If you uh, they are a beautiful species, but um, they need to be set up properly. In order for them to be set up properly, you won't really see them that much. So if you want to be able to see your see a beautiful spider uh, all the time, I suggest not to get this. Um, however, uh, if you uh, would like to get one but you're still on the fence about one, I recommend getting a sling and I will explain how I set up my slings. Um, uh, the reason why you might want to get a sling instead of an adult is because one, they're cheaper so you can get more for the price of one, but also uh, as it grows, your confidence in growing uh, in taking care of it uh, will also grow, which is a big factor when dealing with certain species like uh, haplopelmas. Uh, okay, a few things uh, to start. It's always good to know where they come from. So uh, the Haplopelma genus is found in Southeast Asia. Uh, those countries include Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, which used to be called Burma, and the border of China where it touches those other countries. Uh, since it's a tropical species, uh, that means they have higher humidity requirements, but I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, also, they tend to like higher temperatures. Um, I keep mine in the 70 degree Fahrenheit range, uh, mostly at 75 degrees. Uh, you can go a little higher. Uh, the maximum I would say to, to not go past is probably about 85, but really I would uh, keep it no higher than 80 just because um, there's really no need to be that high a temperature anyways. I'm sure you know most people aren't comfortable being in that hot of a, that hot of a condition, but uh, you know. Um, to keep the humid or to keep the temperature, uh, I recommend a space heater. Uh, that's the easiest way and the safest way. I really don't recommend uh, heat maps or uh, heat lamps, just because uh, you really can't control the temperature. There's always you know on a maximum setting, and that way, if you use a space heater, you can always adjust the temperature accordingly to what you want it to be. Um, if you uh, can't get a space heater, then I would get a, a heat mat, um, but I would get one designed for a much smaller tank. That way, uh, you will only be able to change the inside temperature of the tank up to a few degrees, and not like a lot more with like a heat mat designed for that specific size tank you have. Um, they are an old world species, so that means that they have potent venom, but you might hear a lot about how they are called an aggressive species, and I don't really like to call them aggression species. In fact, I think that's a very uh, wrong description of them. Uh, the better description is that they are a defensive species, uh, meaning that aggression applies that they will attack you first. They will, they will be the aggressor, but really they will give you warnings, which is you know commonly called a threat display or a threat pose, and that is telling you to back off. You know, so if you keep antagonizing it, of course it might strike, but it's giving you fair warning that if you don't leave me alone, something bad's going to happen. So calling it an aggressive species is definitely a a wrong description of it, but it's a defensive species. So do not think that I'm calling it a docile species because they're not by any means. Uh, the real important thing about proper uh, husbandry of the haptoma species is their burrow. Um, they are one of the few species that actually need their burrow in order to be happy. Um, in fact, in the wild, some of these burrows can go as far as uh, a foot or more deep down uh, underground. And you might have seen care sheets that say, you know, six inches is adequate. And I disagree. I think, I think you want to give them as much uh, substrate depth as possible. Um, because the less they have to go into a burrow, the more likely they might be defensive or the more likely you might have uh, incidences with them like you might have heard with other people, how they're saying they're having plumbers crazy. And usually when I see those kind of things, I see that their setups have it with only a few inches of substrate for them to work with as a burrow. Um, all my haplopalmas, I gave at least 10 inches of substrate. Um, I would give them more if it's possible. But for practicality reasons, you know, um, it's not. But if you can manage to add more substrate to their uh, enclosures, 
then I highly recommend it. I'll show you in a little bit how I uh, set up my enclosures for my slings and my uh, adults. Um, another thing to note is that um, they are sexual dimorphic in maturity, and that means that once a half a pelmer reaches maturity, uh, the females and the males will look completely different from each other. Um, if you, I have a video of a breeding attempt with one of my Haplopelma albus triadums. Um, if you look at that, you'll see what I mean by sexual dimorphism. Uh, usually, uh, the female of this genus is why everybody likes them because they are the beauties. You know, like when you talk about a cobalt blue, you know, being completely blue, that is a mature female that they're talking about. Uh, the male, on the other hand, they might have blue, but it's usually on the legs. So um, be aware, because I've seen a lot of times when people go to reptile expos, they uh, they get a haplopelma, but you know it's not identified. And when they come to try to get someone to identify it, it turns out it's a mature male, um, because you know right off the bat you can tell um, without just looking for the hooks and the uh, other male organs that I can't remember on the top of my head what they're called, but. So be very aware that if you go to a pet store and you go to a reptile expo that you know exactly what a immature haplopelma looks like and what a mature one looks like because they will look the same until the maturity hits but once maturity hits they'll be completely easily distinguishable and pet shops and reptile shows um, either they don't bother telling people you know they're buying a male or they don't really know but you know, I've seen a lot of times where someone will drop, like I said, female mature females can go for like seventy, sixty, sometimes even a hundred dollars, depending on where you get it. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're dropping a hundred dollars at a pet store, and it's actually a mature male, and it might die within a week, maybe a month or so, and you're out kind of money. So always be aware of what exactly you're looking for uh, with the characteristics. Um, okay. Now I'm going to talk about humidity, which seems to be a huge problem for a lot of people. Uh, I think I think a lot of people get the consumption or get the impression that humidity is all about uh, wetting the substrate, and that is the easiest way to keep humidity up in a tank. But keep in mind, humidity is how much moisture is in the air, and there's a lot of factors. That, uh, that contribute to high humidity. Um, one thing is uh, uh, rain. Um, you know, Southeast Asia is known for its monsoon seasons, which can last, you know, so they, that means they have a huge raining season for a couple of months out of the year. And that, you know, does wet the ground and stuff, but it's, there are also uh, lakes, oceans, and other bodies of water surrounding them that also helps uh, increase humidity so when you know they when those areas of water evaporate it'll rise up into the air and then you know that, that's how, another way to increase humidity so wetting the substrate is a way but don't think of it as uh, as the only way that humidity is maintained and but ultimately what I'm trying to get at is that uh, the substrate doesn't have to be extremely dry or extremely wet in order to keep, say, 70 to 80 percent degree uh, humidity in a tank. In fact, I buy a digital th uh, hydrometer to measure to measure um, to measure the humidity in the tanks. Um, don't get um, the analog ones. If you go to the pet store, you know you'll see those little ones on the dials that you just stick on the tank. And I just find those woefully inaccurate. Um, if you really want an accurate uh, idea of how much humidity you have in a tank, go with the digital one. These are uh, digital hydrometers, but I rarely use these because, um, you know, if you can only maintain like 70% humidity, that's perfectly fine. Like 80% is probably in the extreme range, but uh, the idea is just don't let it dry out, um, you know, because uh, they, they don't need high humidity times all the time. In fact, if you go to like the Weather Channel and you look up the locations, uh, in Thailand, you'll see that during the daytime, you know, the temperatures are really high, which is also another reason uh, where you get uh, high humidity. Lower temperatures uh, tend to keep humidity when drier temperatures tend to dry things out. But when, um, if you go, if you go look up those things, you'll see that during the day, the humidity in Thailand can drop to 50%, while during the nighttime, when it suddenly gets cooler, the humidity can rise all the way up to 80%. But think about 
uh, when they're out the most. They're nocturnal animals, so that means that they're in the burrows, you know, foot deep underground where the temperature is, you know, much lower than outside. So the humidity down there is going to be a lot higher than the humidity upstairs, but it's still dry. You know, and something you don't expect when you hear, you know, they're high humid species, you don't expect them to be in 50% humidity, but it's, it's because they're in their burrows when it happens and they come out when it's, you know, in the 70 range. But what I'm getting at is that humidity is important, but don't freak out if you can't maintain it. I'll show you how I maintain my, uh, my humidity, but um, you know, if, if you can't keep it at 70%, then you should worry, but if, if you keep it at 70%, you should be okay. Um, now I'm going to show you how I take care of my, uh, or how I set up my haplopalmas, and then, uh, and then after that I'll finish off with this, this video. Okay, this is this is uh, what I do for my um, haplopelma slings. Um, I get these at Walmart. They're a gallon. They're a gallon jar. Uh, they're about three dollars. And um, as you can see, it's really simple. All I do is drill some holes, or well, I use a scissors, but I just poke some holes on two sides of the container, and then I fill it with substrate. Now, the key to a proper, the key to a proper um, setup for a haplopelma is packing down the substrate. As you can see, this guy, he's burrow. He's just right there. Um, you know, he's making his burrow. And since it's the daytime, he's not really active right now. But um, packing the substrate down is very, very important. I know I've I've seen some people say they talk about you know their haplopelma uh, burrow had collapsed, and what happens is is they're not packing down the substrate. If you think about them in the wild, uh, they are digging through ground that is practically like concrete. If you go out in the backyard and you try to uh, dig with your hands, you know, it's not an easy task. And so people think that they are incapable of burrowing uh, because it's, you know, that dirt's so hard, but it's actually not the case. They're fully capable of doing it. And so you want to make sure you pack it down really well, almost till it's, it's practically like you can grab a whole chunk of it and it just like clumps together. Um, you want to add water. What I do before I get a before I get a um, a spider in the Haplopelma genus, I always saturate the soil completely, and and then I pack it down again. So make it really, 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 really packed down, and then um, wait, let it you know let it dry, and then usually it's not soaking wet. I mean, you you should pretty much get, understand. I mean, you should know when you've added too much water into these things. I don't I don't know if how how because um, I don't, I just kind of eyeball it, but Anyways, um, once it's all packed down, I just let it dry out, and then I'll introduce him or her into the uh, enclosure. And um, as far as how to keep humidity for these things, like I said, once the ground is already saturated, uh, there's really no need to um, use or keep misting. Like some people say, for humidity to you know mist, they mist weekly and stuff. And that, and misting the tank walls doesn't do anything to increase humidity. I mean, at most, it'll keep the humidity up for like an hour. What you want to do is you want to mist directly into the substrate, at least for the slings. Uh, you want to add more water than just misting for adults. But for slings, you know, you just saturate the soil around, you know, the burrow until you think, you know, until like about an inch or so seems to be soaked up. And then that, that can keep the humidity up in a tank like this for... Um, up to probably a few months. I mean, uh, some of these I haven't missed it, and I've had these guys for a few months into it. You know, it's just it's just because uh, the uh, the substrate I use, which is peat moss, uh, you can find. I find you know I go to local little uh, nurseries. Uh, some people get theirs at Walmart. I don't. The ones at Walmart have chemicals, or they're you know they're they're meant for things with like nitrates and stuff. But I go to like a local nursery and I get peat moss, which is cheaper. And then cocoa earth. Cocoa earth is perfectly fine substrate too, as long as you pack it as well. But I don't, I don't, I don't like it because it doesn't, hold, it doesn't hold the, uh, it doesn't hold the, the water in the substrate uh, a lot. So you might have to. So if you get use eco earth, you will probably have to saturate the soil more often than using peat moss. But also peat moss is a lot cheaper than cocoa earth. But um, I like cocoa or, or sorry peat moss because it holds the water better. And as a result, like I said, I don't have to. Uh, saturate the soil that much and um, 
one thing you'll know, no, uh, you might notice is that your papal palma might not burrow immediately. Um, some will, some won't, some could take a week, some could take more than a week. And if you want them to acclimate better, then I suggest uh, making a pre-made burrow. And what you do simply is like for this, I made a pre-made burrow for this guy. And all I did was I stuck my, whole, my finger straight down into the ground and then kind of circled it around a little bit to make this nice hole as you can see. And as you can see, he, you know, during the night... Uh, he immediately went right down there. Can you see that? Do I need to get a flashlight? Yeah, let's see. See him? He's uh, he's already taken to it. You can see there's kind of some webbing already around to it. And he'll in the next couple of days he'll he'll make it more to his liking. But right now he's just you know kind of freaked out. But that burrow, that pre-made burrow I made for him, you know, helps him adjust a lot better. But um, I this is about eight inches of substrate. And, um, in fact, I'm just going to show you how important burrows are for even slings. I believe it's this guy. No. One of these guys burrowed. Yeah. As you can see, if I... Shiny, can you see through the hole? Can you see the light coming through the hole? Yeah, as you can see, this guy burrowed all the way down to the bottom of the enclosure and that's like I said eight inches of substrate and he and he is just the same size as the one I just showed you so a burrow is very 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 important for even a sling some people say that it's not important but it truly is important and even as slings like I said they burrow deep down so six inches when someone says six inches you can clearly see it since this is eight inches and he already burrowed down to the bottom of the tank you know six inches is just not adequate in my opinion um, now I'm going to show you how, how I set up uh, most of my uh, adult tanks. Um, let's go with these guys over here. This is one of my Hapopelma Hanums, and as you can see, you know, a lot of people say when they open up the tanks, you know, they're coming right at you, and they're, you know, they're, you know, threat display and stuff. And as you can see, she is calm as calm as can be, and. That just goes to show you how important a burrow is to them. Now, what I do for an adult, because I find that adults take longer to burrow, is I make a pre-made burrow, and, 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 don't, and I actually use a piping for it. And the piping is like a joint piping you might find at Menards and stuff, and usually I get like about a 3 inch inch diameter, and then I bury it at a diagonal angle into the tank. Now, why do I do that? Well, bur these particular burrowing species tend to be a lot... Um, a lot simple in their design of the burrows sometimes other burrowing features will okay so uh, now go here uh, so if you have say a 10 gallon tank these are the kind of dimension you, uh, you're dealing with um, I give in a 10 gallon tank it, it's about 12 feet high or maybe 11 feet depending but what I do is I give it um, 10 I fill about 10 inches of the tank and then obviously you have about 20 inches across the 10 gallon tank so if you use basic you know geometry from high school and to say that's where the pipe is that you put down for the pre-made burrow and they start from going down there you can see that if they reach all the way bottom at an angle then they have about close to two feet of substrate to burrow deep down now they won't always go straight down um, this guy his probably stopped around right here but even if they stop right down here, they're still going down, usually to the bottom. So basically, you know, that's still probably about a nice deep burrow that, you know, that they can feel happy with. And as you can see, she's perfectly happy. Now, what you will see, though, sometimes is that they'll start adding modifications. And you wonder, you know, you worry that, you know, will they, you know, will they get too big for them? Because, you know, obviously you can't adjust the size diameter of the pipe. And I start, and I, like I said, I use um, a three inch diameter uh, joint section of a pipe. So, you know, you don't want to get one that goes all the way down to the tank. You just want to get one that's probably about like, three inches long, but a diameter of, uh, you know, three inches. But they start out with, they like it, they like the tunnel to be nice um, and tight for them because, you know, that makes them feel safe because these burrows are like their panic room. So, um, don't worry so much about them getting stuck in it because um, ultimately if, it's t if, if the burrow gets too narrow they can't squeeze and what they'll do is they'll just abandon that burrow and they'll start another one. <clears throat> but sometimes if you do it that way, um, 
you'll get something like this. And as you can see, he kind of he kind of burrowed straight up instead of to the angle. Um, and you might think that when I have this on, that it's that it, you know it's completely blocking the burrow. And actually, they they know where to stop. Like if they think this will block it. Well, I mean, they won't know this is a screen, but they'll think it's some kind of natural force. They'll actually stop right before it um, it gets there. So, you know, if if they do end up covering it completely, then, you know, just knock it. N don't knock the burrow down completely, but just, you know, open up the sides a little bit so he does have room. But it's usually not an issue. Um, one thing to notice is you'll notice there's peat moss. Uh, it does have a problem with getting mushrooms sometimes but just a little bit of spot cleaning as you can see and it's not really an issue so don't freak out if you see if you are using peat moss and you see mushrooms um some others now some things you might happen if uh some things that might happen if you make it a pre-made bro they might not take it um usually they will for the most part but not all the time as you can see this one did not use my pre-made burrow I had, and in fact decided to burrow all the way down on the side of the tank. In fact, there she is right there. Can you see that? There she is, right back. Watch out. I think it's the focus. Yeah, it's not, it's not that important, but yeah, so as you can see, but up from right here, like I said, as you can see, she, she she, she pretty much, you know, stopped right at the thing, but then you can see right there that she wanted to get out. She just goes right there, so it leads right out into the tank, but ultimately, about, I'd say about 75, about 75% success rate for setting up the, uh, the, the tanks like that. I don't expect you to see it yet, but, um, but sometimes it doesn't always work, but it does for most often not, so that's, that's, that's a really easy way to meet the requirements of a mature Hapalpelma uh, female uh, in a 10 gallon tank. Now, obviously, if you don't have a whole lot of room, then you know you might not have room for a 10 gallon tank. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get a Hapalpelma. Ultimately, if you can find an enclosure that can get um, at least 10 inches um, or more of a substrate depth, then go for it. You know, um, they don't need, like some terrestrials, they'll, uh, you know, they say that the horizontal space is important, but for something like the Hapalpelma, it's always about how much depth you can give them. Uh, they don't really venture far past their burrows. In fact, um, most often not, you will see them only during the nighttime, and even then, it'll be just their legs, and so they don't they don't they don't wander around like say a Rosie or a B a Smithy might over over time in their tanks. So they'll usually just stay in one localized area. So tanking on a tank, in all honesty, you know, it takes up a lot of space for just something that's only going to you know utilize about 50 percent, maybe even 30 percent of the tank. But it's it's it it. It, the main thing is, is you want to make sure that they that they have a nice deep burrow that they can make, and then if they do decide to go a little farther past their burrow, it will only you know they still have a few inches, but that's as far as they'll go. So um, so if you can't get it, if you if there's not enough room for a 10 gallon tank, um, then then if you can find something uh, you know at least to give it enough substrate of 10 inches or more, then that should be fine as well. Um, before I forget. What I do, if you do go to like say Walmart, Walmart's, uh, I like, I like Walmart when I get these 10 gallon tanks because I like these, I like these screens that they, that you can also get with them. Um, what I do is, um, ventilation, the amount of ventilation you give something, uh, relative to humidity, the more ventilation you get, the less humidity you're going to have and vice versa. Um, so when you, if you decide to use a 10 gallon tank, uh, if you can get one of these screens at Walmart. Uh, or I guess any screen really. Then all you, then what I do is I get some glad seal wrap and I just kind of cover it all up. But then you know there's these little holes for screens uh, that you use to lock the tank. But I don't use the locking mechanism because you know I don't worry about them trying to escape because like I said they live in a burrow and they really aren't that adventurous once they get the burrow established. So then I just I just puncture holes 
to where the locking things go. And then, and then that's about it as far as humidity. But also keep in mind, you might not think that's enough hu or enough ventilation. But in fact, these aren't really flush to the tank anyways. So there's definitely like cracks when it's placed onto the tank. So there's there's plenty of ventilation. Just just uh, it's just restricted a lot to keep the humidity in. Um, uh, as far as rehousing them, uh, keep in mind that. These are burrowing species, and very rarely do they make multiple burrows. For some some reason, some people believe that um, burrowing species, like out of their you know in their lifetime, will just up and leave their burrow, and that does happen you know on occasion. But there's usually a reason for it, whether you know just a bad location, they can't go very deep because maybe they're on around bedrock or something. But if you think about it, you know being exposed out in the open for them is very bad. Uh, so they don't. You know, so they just don't up and leave a burrow. In fact, some uh, species, you know, will live in one burrow their whole entire life in the wild. So what I'm getting at is um, rehousing them should only happen if, one, it's getting too big for its enclosure. Like like I said, these guys will have to be rehoused because they can't keep them in there, you know, as an adult. But, you know, they can live there for, you know, a couple, for quite a bit of molts if you buy a sling. And then, and then maybe, I mean, and, and this, and, it, and, and you know, some of these guys will probably be in there for a year or more until they get to an adequate size that they get too big. The only other time you should rehouse them is if you have a mold issue that you can't control. Now, if you use Eco Earth, uh, mold should not happen just because um, it's it's neutral or um, it has it, it's basically in, impossible for the molt to grow on the eco earth but on peat moss it can it can spread but if like I said spot cleaning should take care of it but if you absolutely cannot stop it then then you should rehouse it if otherwise there's absolutely no reason why you need to switch out the substrate for any of these guys because all the constant rehousing for them it's just going to cause undue stress for them because like I said they don't make multiple burls. They keep one, they make it longer or bigger to whatever to suit their needs, and then that's it. So um, it's not like the dirt is going to get any, it's not like if you buy fresh dirt, it's any cleaner than the dirt you originally have. Now, you know, you may, you know, they, they will eat, but usually the remains of what they eat is pretty small. So, um, if you're worried that the burrow inside is getting too dirty, well, you got to also remember that you know it's not like they have anybody to come out and clean their burrows out in the wild either. And usually, what happens is, is if you give it too big of a prey item and the remains are too big for its liking, then it will usually cast it out of the burrow, and you'll see that you know you'll see the remains of of whatever its leftovers outside the burrow, and then you can just pick it up. Otherwise, um, you know they don't they, they don't get really that dirty with the remains. However, if you are concerned about cleanliness in your tank, then I recommend uh, to get a cleaning crew. Um, uh, there are two types. You can either get tropical wood lice. Um, I find it hard to find those, and your most um, your most bet would be to get a isopods. Basically, they're they're these roly poly things that you probably encountered out in the woods, you know, under logs or dead or dead rotting. Um, uh, logs and under rocks and stuff and, and those guys are essentially like cleaning a cleaning crew that you might have in a fish tank that you know uh, like lampreys or whatever those uh, those fish those uh, the black fish I can't remember what they're called what are they called? Uh, plecos. Plecos? I think. Yeah so uh, go salt water. Yeah or a salt water tank since my buddy who's the video camera right now he's uh, he's got a salt water crabs water. and snails. Yeah so anyways so you can get a, uh, a cleaning crew for your Hapalpelma tank now uh, these now the isopods. The reason why they work for Hapalpelma tanks is because they need uh, high humidity as well. So if you if you're seeing this video and be like, hmm, I wonder if I should put some isopods in my rosy tank. No, they will not survive. Uh, any any species of spider that uh, needs dry conditions uh, will not uh, survive in those tanks. Uh, they have to be in tanks with you know above. I'd say 70% humidity, so that's why they're perfect for uh, hapalpelmas. Now, your hapalpelmas may eat your isopods. In fact, my T. stermi, um, or my Theraphosa stermi, she actually uh, chowed down and hauled her isopods that I put in her tank, and it's actually quite funny seeing a six-inch spider munching down on like a one-inch, or a point, a point one-inch uh, isopod. 
but they could eat it, and there's nothing you really can do about it, and they won't and it won't harm your tea. But you know, you might have to constantly uh, fit. You might have to constantly add in um, a cleaning crew if that does happen. But like I said. You know, it, it, they don't. They're spi spiders are pretty clean, so you know you won't have to worry about um, all that much maintenance. Just spot cleaning, and then if something is out of control, then you should think about rehousing. Otherwise, you know, I know some people who have you know their burrowing spiders in you know substrate they haven't changed out for years. One guy I even read one somewhere guy hasn't changed it for over ten years. So just gives you an idea that rehousing these guys constantly is not beneficial for them. It's just stress them out. Will they die if you keep on doing it? No. But do you want to have to deal with a you know a defensive spider every time you get it out? Probably not. So, you know, it's kind of a win win situation for both and it's also easier on your money because, you know, buying dirt, even though it's cheap, it does add up. Now, when you do rehouse your spiders, there's two methods to do it. There's um one method basically I call it flooding the burrow, and it's it's exactly what that is. You're basically adding water down in the burrows, and then ultimately the spider will come up to the entrance. Sometimes, if you're lucky, they will they will you know completely come out. So other times they'll just be just the top part of the burrow, and then you have to figure out how to get them out of the rest. Sometimes you just want to you know you want to go a little deeper past them to kind of block them off from going down anymore, and then just kind of you know push them out. Um, it's not 100% effective. Uh, I've had uh, one sling actually who got so stubborn she stayed down there completely submerged underwater. And surprisingly enough, I mean, tarantulas can stay underwater for a short amount of time. So don't freak out if you know all of a sudden your spider's you know completely underwater. But you know don't let it you know stay like that. But um, my point is it doesn't work all the time. But the idea behind it is, is you want to basically simulate a you know their their burrow getting flooded. You know because like I said they live in around areas where monsoon happens, and you know we're talking 40 you know 50 inches of rain you know you know just in that season alone. So you know they they definitely uh, are not um, they are definitely not. Uh, they're definitely used to, you know, their burrow potentially being flooded. So, but you don't want to just pour water in. I get this. This is a washing bottle. You can get it at any, basically any lab store. Um, and I like it because the stream it produces is, you know, very, 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 very tiny. So, you know, like when you when you pour the water down, you don't have to worry about pouring too much water down that the spider can't, you know, get pushed back in the burrow because there's so much water. So. Um, these are good for like slings and these work sometimes for adults, but for adults you might try to get something that has a little bit more of a stream to it. But you know, the idea is, is you're essentially flooding the water and as the water rises from the end of the burrow, you know, then the spider is going to, you know, with one of its legs or something, it's going to feel that water, you know, start rising up behind it and then it's just going to walk back up to the top. Um, sometimes though, if you're not careful, they will dart back down. Um, so, you know, it's not an effective, it's, it's not a guaranteed method, and the only true guaranteed method is to dig them out, unfortunately, but things you want to do when you try to dig them out is you want to, you know, if you're getting a big spider, in, you know, in a big tank, you know, probably um, get one of these uh, shovels, the gardening shovels to dig them out, or if it's a sling, you know, just a spoon, you know, is all you need, but Ultimately, you don't want to dig at the burrow. All that will do is will collapse the burrow. That won't kill your spider, but you know, then as you're digging in the burrow, you know, you have the problem as well. Am I gonna? Is this when next time I dig it? Is that gonna be where the spider is? And two things could happen: your spider could jump out at you and run away, you know, and then you have to go find it, or it's gonna, you know, throw up a threat display, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have to deal with a defensive spider. Um, or you could do something worse and you can accidentally stab your spider while you're digging it. So dig around the burrow and um, and then as you're digging uh, and then until and, and, and as you're digging basically you're you're keeping the burrow intact until you get to the bottom. Sometimes you can't get all the way down the bottom and the burrow ends up collapsing at the very end. Not a huge deal but like I said uh, you don't you want to avoid collapsing it because then you don't know where your spider is exactly so you know you don't know what to get but just go slowly dig around the burrow until you find it and can get it out now once you find it depending on the size if it's a sling you know just get a little cup or if it's an adult you know a Tupperware I don't I mean this is probably you know too small for you know to completely 
engulf the spider, but something like a Tupperware to place over the spider and then get something solid that you can just slide under it or at least or it can coax it to go further up the you know further up the whatever you're using to to block it in and then then just keep it in there and then and then transfer it over to wherever you're putting it or if you're reusing that tank then you know just hold, putting it someplace until you are ready to put it back in um but again only do that if it's too big for if the spider's too big for the enclosure or you can't get it in the mold otherwise there's really no need to rehouse them um, feeding requirements, uh, just like any spider, uh, the normal is uh, a one prey size um, that is, you know, of of adequate size for that particular spider. You know, it's one of those eyeball things. Uh, Haplopelmas, they're pretty much stone cold killers right off the bat. So you don't. I I've never had to deal with pre killed food. I doubt there's a Haplopelma that I'm aware of that as a sling that needs pre killed food. Um, so, you know, if, you know, um, if you have to do, if the, it won't eat, you know, then you can try pre-killed food, you know, the easiest way is to get a cricket and of, of a size, you know, if it's a, if it's really tiny, then, you know, like a pinhead or a small cricket and just crush the head and then place it by the spider. But like I said, they're pretty much stone cold killers. Um, if you just got it, like say you just got it in the mail, you put it in, don't feed it right off the bat. Give it a few days, you know, because they'll need time to adjust. Um, if it's still not eating after a few days, uh, then it could be for various other reasons. Um, one, that it's still stressed out from about being in the burrow, and two, it's, it might be in pre-molt. In either case, um, don't freak out. If, if the abdomen looks fine, it might be small because some places, you know, they, 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 you know, they, they ration out their feeding times, you know, then... If it's of decent size, then you shouldn't too worried. If it starts shrinking, then you're worried. But, um, like I said, it's not a real huge issue. I haven't really had to deal with a problem with it yet. But um, for adults, I usually feed them roaches. Um, uh, but I feed uh, them a lot. And I have a lot longer uh, feeding periods for them just because uh, roaches are high in uh, fats and so one roach can, you know, plump them up really fast. And you don't, when, you, when you're dealing with an adult, you, the, you don't really want to overfeed them. So uh, if you do, you know, some people do feed them roaches. So um, if you do feed them roaches, just don't, I don't recommend feeding a roach once a week. Um, I, I, like I said, I feed them like once every tw two weeks. Um, another, another main thing to worry about is do not, put the food down in the burrow. They will they will find it. If you've watched any of my feeding videos, you know fully well they're fully capable of getting the food when they want to. So do not shove it down there, especially a cricket. The last thing you want to do is shove a cricket down the burrow and not knowing if your tea is molting and then finding a dead tea with a cricket munching on it. That's the worst thing you can do. But so, you know, just put the cricket in there and then it will most likely disappear, you know, unless you want to watch it, then just wait patiently and I'm sure it'll pop out. But um, one thing you should notice, signs that, signs that their haplopelma is getting ready to molt, uh, one of the easiest ways to know is that they are, um, they are molting is that they will cover up their burl. They'll just seal it up with their webbing and they'll just be like that for, depending on the size of the tea. If it's a sling, it could be a week, it could be a little bit more. If it's an adult, it could be over a month. But if that thing has been sealed off for a long period of time, the most likely answer is it's in pre-molt and it's, you know, it's waiting to molt. Um, that is a very hard thing to go through for, a, for an owner of one of these because you probably won't see your haplopelma uh, while it's molting, so you just have to play the waiting game. I know the, the impulse is to think it's dead after not seeing it for a week or so, but you have to trust in your spider that he is fine. Um, Usually what will happen is, is once it's done molting and it's hardened up, it will open up its burrow again and it's ready to resume normal behavior. So until, so once that burrow is sealed off, it is telling you basically to leave it alone. And that's what you need to do. You need to leave it alone and not mess with it. Um, getting worried and trying to dig up, dig it, dig it up is just going to do more harm than good. So just relax, take a deep breath, and just believe that your spider will be fine. Uh, not all the times will it seal it off and indicate burrowing. Sometimes they just want to be left alone and they'll seal it off 
and it'll be like that for a day or two, then open back up, you know, like that. Um, another time they might do it is when they're gravid. If you, you know, breeding project, then um, then they might do that, and that means they're getting ready to drop a sack. But the most likely scenario is that they're getting ready to molt, or they just fed. If they just have, if they also have, uh, you just put a food in there, and you look in a few hours later, and you see the burrow sealed off. Most likely means they caught the prey and they are eating it and they put on a do not disturb sign because they're eating it and they'll usually open that back up within the next day or so and they're ready you know but 99 percent of the time when that bro is sealed off for a long period of time it's most likely in pre -mold. now say you you have it say it did not uh say it did not mold properly and it's dead in the bro how do i know well mo well the logical uh thing is it's going to start smelling if you start seeing a smell in the tank then it's most likely means that you know your spiders died down there. Another indication is is it's most likely you'll see mold start emanating from the burrow, like it, you know it's like it's growing. It's not growing from the top down. It's going from the bottom up. If you start seeing that, then that could mean something happened. But um, I have not experienced that kind of problem with their molting. So you know something might have been wrong with your spider beforehand. Um, one common uh, problem that I've seen people ask is, um, you know, I've had my spider, I've had my haplopalma, why hasn't it broed yet? Uh, one of the answers could be, uh, it's a mature male. Like I said at the beginning, um, mature males are sexually dimorphic, but if you buy it from a pet store or a reptile expo, there's a good chance you might have ended up buying a mature male without knowing it if you don't know what you're looking for. And if it is indeed a mature male, then it'll have no drive to burrow. Once it hits maturity, it's looking for a mate, and that's about it. So um, that could be a reason. Another one, like I said, older species tend to uh, burrow, or take longer to burrow, because like I said, they, they don't make multiple burrows in their lifetime. It might just be one burrow. So how would you like it if you've lived in a house for like 10 years, and then suddenly have to move into another house? You know, it's gonna take some time for you to adjust to that too. So. Um, that's why I like to make pre-made burrows for older for older species because uh, they they seem to, to acclimate to that better and are used to it better. But sometimes uh, old or sometimes uh, they just won't burrow until you know six or seven months down the road. I, I had a haplophylum live in them. Uh, she I gave her a pre-made burrow and she basically just you know kept into the pre-made burrow but never really did anything to it like I'm used to with my other ones. And she just burrowed, you know, and she didn't do anything to it until about four or five months down the road when she was close to pre, or she was in pre-mold, and that's when she did a major overhaul to it and made a burrow. But sometimes you just have to be patient. If yours isn't burrowing or taking to a pre-made burrow for a long period of time, you can add a hide to it, um, but do not use a hide as a substitute for a burrow because it's just not the same, you know, a hide, like... If you think about it, would you like being thrown into, you know, would, uh, you know, would you think a, you know, room that, you know, you can't feel the walls without, you know, you can't feel the walls um, with your hands and it's just completely pitch dark, you know, it kind of messes with you, you know, there could be something else in there and you don't know it. So that's why they like tight confines because they know that nothing can go past them. It'll always be up in front of them. So a hide will work, you know, to keep them so they're not, you know, so out in the open, but it's just a poor substitute for a burrow. They, they, they need that burrow. I cannot stress that enough. Um, I think that's about it. I hope I answered all your questions. Um, if there is any question I did not answer, feel free to uh, ask them. And then one thing before I forget. Um, some people have used uh, um, fogging systems that you might use for tropical frogs or lizards, you know, that, that live in the rainforest, you know, and they use that as a way to increase humidity. Um, I don't, I, I tried that out once, and honestly, it, it's not, it doesn't really work that well, because um, it doesn't penetrate the soil, so a fogging system is just the equivalent of uh, basically missing the sides of the tank, and um, if, if you are if you're doing that, then you're not really raising humidity up. And I, and I know then the logical thing would be to increase the time in the fogging system, but, you know, that's just going to bother the tea because, you know, then, you know, it's just getting covered in wet, you know, cold water. So um, don't, I wouldn't recommend using a fire. I can't stop you from using one, but I don't find them effective in raising the humidity. 
So the best bet to raise humidity or keep maintain humidity, like I said, is to pour directly into the substrate. Just make sure that you don't pour it directly onto the burrow. You know, pour it where the burrow is not. If you don't know where the burrow is, then just pour the substrate in the substrate lightly. Don't just pour water in. You know, maybe uh, you know, like I said, maybe you get a washer bottle and just pour it on the substrate. But pouring in the substrate is the best bet to maintain humidity. Um, that is it. Thank you for watching, and I hope that was helpful.